it going? So first, I'm, I'm Christian Post. I'm a global field CTO here at Solo. I've been here for over four years now. Before that, I was at Red Hat. Um, I got involved in, uh, in Istio and Service Mesh in early 2017. And I was part of the founding of uh, the open source project and community. I've written a number of books on this. One I've co-authored here with Lynn Sun. I uh, also very um, admired and, uh, and respected in the Istio community. So like Brian pointed out, the area that we focus on is those problems that you run into when you've deployed onto a cloud platform. Kubernetes containers is usually what we're looking at. Um, and those problems arise because we're deploying into ephemeral, highly dynamic infrastructure. When you deploy an application, you might scale it up or scale it down, or it might become unhealthy. There's no guarantees about exactly how the, you know, the distributed nature of these services will behave over the network, and there's no guarantees about what the infrastructure gonna, is gonna do. It could kill a replica and move it over to a different node or, or whatever. And this is, a, this is a departure from at least when I was an engineer and I was building services at a big global bank. Um, the premise there was nothing's ever gonna go down because we have redundant networks and Oracle Rack and all this great stuff, web logic, this, this, it'll never go down. But then inevitably it did or does, and you know the applications, how we think about solving these problems in uh, especially in a highly distributed world like, like this uh, changes. This, the same technologies that we use in the past might not fit this, uh, this paradigm as well. Um, Brian walked us through the way at Solo we think about solving these challenges, solving problems at the gateway layer or the edge of a boundary, solving the problems inside a particular boundary in the so-called east-west direction or service to service direction, and then tying this down deeper into the lower layers of the network, networking stack like uh, you would find in Kubernetes, things like the CNI. Now along the way, we, uh, you know, we're, we're, we support things like RPC style communication, REST is very popular, open API spec, gRPC is very popular. Um, and one thing that we noticed is that uh, people were, were not only interested in these uh, point RPC calls, but in how do you aggregate and federate um, data coming back from multiple services. And that's obviously an area where GraphQL has sprung to prominence. And you know, I'll talk a little bit about how that plays into our, uh, our, our product stack as well. So then we got to start with what we, we keep referring to application networking. What does that mean? And you know, trying to boil it down as, as much as possible, it's when applications are talking with each other. When you deploy, to Kubernetes, these, these applications need to communicate over the network. They might be talking with their peer services, they might be talking with databases, or message queues, or caches, or whatever, but they need to communicate over the network. And when you deploy in a cloud platform, like a container-based one like Kubernetes, you have to find, first of all, you have to find, in this example, where is service B? How does service A know where to talk to service B? And because of the dynamic nature, we have to um, <clears throat> be responsive to when service B fails or gets moved to different availability zones or regions or, or whatever. We need to be able to discover that. So things like service discovery is extremely important. Things like adaptive and client-side load balancing is extremely important. Um, resilience aspects of the communication. You can't just make a call and, and sit around waiting for the response forever. We have to have you know, proactive timeouts or if a request fails and it's appropriate to, we should try a retry. Um, circuit breaking, um, security, you know, authorizations, what services are allowed to access what data and call which services. Uh, tracing, you know, extensibility, these types of things are extremely important and problems that you have to solve when applications are communicating with each other over the network, they're not optional. Because if you don't solve them, then you run into scenarios where um, you know, things fail unpredictably, uh, very difficult to debug, potentially cause cascading failures, 
Um, and so, so these, these have to be solved, or security breaches. Uh, here's a few more examples. So yes. For a glue network, when you say network policy, are you referring to Istio's implementation, Kubernetes API implementation, or are you creating your own version? Kubernetes network policy in that in that particular. Case. Okay, got it. And the derivatives, the implementations. But, got it. But we'll talk about that. Okay, thank you. All right, can you hand me that water right there? Um, okay, so further refining what is application networking? Uh, things like how many retries can a service call when things fail? Um, you can call this service, but only when the originator lives in this availability zone and only at this time of the day. Or this service to service call was kicked off by a particular user, and that user has only the authorizations to see a particular set of, uh, of data. And um, a lot of times, you know, in the past at least, we would try to implement these things by standing up some team saying, hey, you're responsible for doing this somehow. And we've seen in the past things like the enterprise service bus spring up. Right? That's where we tried to solve a lot of these integration sounding or networking challenges. Or even farther back, I don't know how many of you have seen, certainly at large financial institutions, where they just forced everything through MQ. Right? We'll put everything through these messaging queues. There we can see the traffic. There we can kind of secure it. There we can try to uh, control it to some degree. MQ is an asynchronous messaging technology. We built request and reply over, over, uh, over MQ. Uh, and then more recently, things like API management. So if we all just go to REST, then we'll just force everything through these centralized gateways that, that perform the service for us. But like I said, in a highly dynamic world where services are coming and going, uh, they could be spread out across multiple availability zones, multiple clouds. Um, things like the, the older API management solutions didn't have the fine-grained visibility understanding of what is a container, what happens when a container goes away, um, how do you run these things on Kubernetes if you choose to do that. Um, and on top of that, what we end up seeing was because of the way those things were implemented, you had a centralized team and you set up workflows that flowed through that centralized team to try to get anything else done. All right, so you created workflow bottlenecks, you created technology bottlenecks, and you know, as you go to uh, uh, cloud, cloud 1.0 and cloud 2.0, that uh, it doesn't work out as well. How many of you are familiar with a diagram that kind of looks like this? <laughs> lots and lots of load balancers, everything forced through some centralized clearinghouse, um, obviously, the team that, that they've sprung uh, uh, around these, uh, these types of systems are the gatekeepers and control, you know, hey, I need to change the routing to look like this, or I need to change it to look like this, and so on. Now, the public clouds are actually the cloud, you know, the, 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 the folks like Netflix and others that built their services in the clouds, you know, from the beginning, they didn't go to some big centralized model like this. What they ended up doing is saying, hey, we're going to just use this particular language uh, or these couple, couple languages, and we're going to build libraries. You're going to put everything into the applications themselves. So we would, you know, and actually Netflix and uh, Google and some of these others open source some of these, these projects. And we saw uh, enterprises starting to go to uh, adopting these. Now, the challenge of doing this in an enterprise was there's not as much control over what languages and frameworks that you can use. I mean, different groups were doing different things. Some people were using Java, different flavors of Java, reactive and not reactive, and Java EE and all this stuff. Some people were using Node.js. Some people adopted Ruby and so on. And they needed to solve these problems in all of those languages and all of those frameworks. And for an enterprise, that became quite un untenable uh, because they were half-baked implementations to begin with. They were inconsistent implementations between the languages. Um, and uh, you know, if you found a bug or a, an issue and you had to patch it in one, you had to try to patch it in all of them. And then you had to go tell the developers, hey, we patched this library, now, now go update your code correctly. Um, and so once you started to get into an environment that was a lot of languages, a lot of frameworks, deployed into Kubernetes, 
um, it, it became really difficult to manage the, uh, the complexity, the overhead, the inconsistency, which would lead to uh, unpredictable and, uh, and unknown behaviors. And, uh, and so that's, that's the genesis for how do, we, how do we correctly solve this problem in a cloud world, in a container world, uh, using and applying some of the same principles that we did that, that was, uh, you know, how Docker came up. Do Docker came up and said, hey, we can just package this application. I don't care what application's inside of it. We're going to package it the same way. Kubernetes came up and said, well, I don't care what's running in these containers. I'm going to start and stop the applications the same way. I'm going to check health the same way, and I'm going to deploy them the same way without understanding or caring really what's inside the application. So we, we found these cross-cutting patterns that we could apply to our applications and, and then build tooling and automation around that. And that's exactly what uh, you know, we start to do at this next layer, this application networking layer. How can we take the behaviors that we need on behalf of the application as it communicates over the network and package that up in such a way that any application, any language, any framework can end up using it. And now we get consistency of these implementations, right? It's implementation one, implemented one way. Um, you know, the business logic, the application developers, they don't have to bake all of the, these libraries and transitive dependencies and you know certain ways of writing code into their business logic. We can start to, uh, in a cross-cutting way, get the behaviors that we want on, on the network when applications are communicating with each other. And we do this by deploying a little process or a little proxy that implements these networking behaviors along with the application. So if, some, if you're familiar with service mesh, this is, this is the mesh part. That services are communicating with each other by first talking through this little proxy that implements the networking behavior. The proxy then sends the traffic out over the network. Um, and if you have a lot of these proxies, you need some way to configure them from a, from a centralized location. Right, we don't want to log into each of these applications and, or, or containers and um, start editing text files or SFTPing files around. Uh, we need an API. We need a way to dynamically configure these, uh, these proxies so that they adhere to certain policies about how services are allowed to communicate with each other. It's a little bit more colorful. Hopefully that sort of shows up on the, on the screen. But so this is what an, a, a service mesh looks like. This is an Istio service mesh. So service A is deployed with a proxy with a, uh, side, as, as a sidecar. This sidecar implements this application networking behavior. And when service A wants to talk to service C, it'll first go through the proxy. The proxy will do things like collect telemetry, how many requests per second are going through. It'll do things like um, route the traffic to healthy instances of service C, because the service mesh can do discovery and understand what endpoints are healthy and what endpoints are available, and ignore ones that are not. Uh, it'll do, it can do things like originate TLS or mutual TLS with the services. Um, it can do things like send tracing information off to an observability system. Thank you. Like think Jaeger or Zipkin or you know, distributed tracing spans like that. Um, and it can control, maybe service C is deployed in multiple versions, version one, version two. Maybe version two is a new version that we want to uh, slowly roll traffic over. The proxy in service A has the ability to shift and control and, and manage traffic to various services. So the, the proxies that are running with the services, you know, they're almost atomic with, they're a part of the application. And in Kubernetes, this would just be two containers running in a single pod. Um, the control plane is the, is the thing communicating with the proxies and dynamically configuring them uh, over, the, over the network. And then end users or platform owners would be using some sort of configuration to drive the control plane, custom resources in, uh, in, in Kubernetes. Let me pause there.
see whether there's any that makes sense everyone on the same page about service mesh yes sir uh, question on the on the sidecar so you listed all the decision points that you can make in there and this is probably just my my ignorance in this space because i'm very much a learner still in cloud are you defining those like you're writing code that makes those decisions or are those configurable options that exist already within sidecar they're conf they're configurable options you don't you're not writing any code they're, they are behaviors that exist in the proxy so somebody has written this it's c++ envoy c++ there's uh various configuration options that you can pass to the proxy uh, but the control plane um, uses a declarative format. So think Kubernetes custom resource. You define this is the behavior that I want, and then the control plane then translates that to configuration that it sends to the proxy. So, with it, so then when service A is looking for service C, and I'll just say, like you picked version, I'll, I'll, I'll key off that one. So the sidecar running on service A, it also has that configuration as well as saying I am version one of whatever and I'm looking for version two of whatever. So the, the control plane will know where the service C instances are. It'll know where B is and A is and everything. When it configures A, it's going to say, hey, if you want to talk to service C, here's the list of endpoints that exist currently. And uh, maybe there's five endpoints there. And that that fifth one, so one through four is version one, that fifth one is version two. And if the operator, if the user says, hey, route 90% of the traffic or 75% of the traffic to version one, the Envoy and service A will know what endpoints make up version one, and 75% of the requests that need to go to a service C will go to version one of the service C. Right, so we can, the, the control plane gives the sidecar enough information and the policy that it needs to execute to be able to do that. Kind of thinking like a real world example of that, that, that like I've personally seen, it's like, okay, well sometimes in my app, I'm seeing the new version of something for whatever reason. And there mm -hmm. could be something like that yeah. in play where it's saying, all right, this many percentage of the users yep. out of this area, we're going to send them to the new version or exactly. something along those lines. Exactly. And the reason why you might want to do that is, let's say, for uh, service C, you introduce a change in service C. And when you roll it out to users, you don't want to big bang roll it out to everybody because maybe it is a detrimental change. So we want to slowly expose that change. And we would control, maybe we would say only 5% of traffic should go to the new version of service C. And then we're going to watch Prometheus and watch the telemetry and make sure that everything looks good, response times are good, you know, no errors and all that. And then we'll maybe move it to 10% yeah. and yeah. slowly and, and so on. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yep. Go ahead. When you, when you talk about discovery, so this proxy can do the discovery, does it mean that is your control plane as a directory of some sort of all the yes. services or, or it happens, you know, automatically in some way they connect to each other? I mean, yeah, the, no, exactly. The, the Istio control plane knows about the services. First of all, in a Kubernetes world, it knows about the services that are in Kubernetes because it can just query Kubernetes. It also knows about what services are in the mesh because it knows what applications that have sidecars are connected to the control plane. So the Istio control plane does keep a registry of what services are are available and what endpoints make up those services. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. So the, dis the discovery happens from the proxy that, you know, query the, the control plane. Yes. The control plane knows what the configuration for service A's sidecar should be. And when the service A sidecar connects to the control plane, control plane gives it its correct configuration. Okay, very good. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Like like Brian mentioned in the intro and in the opening, so Istio's been around for May 2017. So whatever that is, almost six years. Um it's had some ups and downs. I think when it was first released it was uh fairly experimental. Um the focus on those, in those early days was 
Are we getting the use cases right? Um, what should the API look like? And what should the deployment architecture look like? Because you know, a lot of the a lot of the design and decision came from uh, what Google had done internally, but that didn't translate directly to the way people wanted to use a service mesh in in open source or in a enterprise. Um, so I would say for the first couple of years, there was a pretty um, you know steep <laughs> uh, maturation process that was happening for uh, for Istio uh, until around Istio one dot. Um, 1.6, I would say. So once Istio got to 1.6, a lot of the architectural changes kind of settled out. Um, a lot of the, you know, there, there was some uh, uh, performance improvements. There was some usability improvements. And, uh, you know, that, then, then we started to see a um, dramatic uptick in adoption in Istio. And what that did, so once people actually started using it in real use cases, I don't mean just like hello world on a pilot cluster. I mean in real production use cases deployed at scale across hundreds of clusters, that's when we started to see things like, well, the edge cases that you would have never seen just by contributing to open source, unless it was actually run in an enterprise, we started running into those edge cases. And so from about Istio 1.6 to 1.8, or so, 1.9, uh, we started to continue to refine the, uh, the, you know, the, the implementation to the point now that you know, Istio has become, I, I would argue, the de facto, that's where people start looking. Uh, it hits a lot of the enterprise use cases, and um, at least in our experience, it is extremely widely deployed, and, uh, and people get a lot of value out of it. Now, there was some hiccups also in terms of the politics behind it. Istio was supposed to go to the CNCF, then it didn't, and uh, that pissed some people off, but eventually it made it into the CNCF. In October this 2022, it made it into the, the CNCF. Uh, if you go to the, you know, the, like I said, it's, it's widely deployed. We've done uh, a number of uh, talks with the, the community users. Um, you know, we, meant, we showed you this slide. Now, Istio as a foundational piece, you can think of Istio as giving you the a set of tools or a toolbox to, to start to lay the foundation for things like a zero trust type architecture or for getting you know, the entry level or table stakes type telemetry collection and you know, what's going on, on on the network between these services and, and resilience and so on. But when we see people take Istio, and actually try to deploy it themselves into production, they run into a lot of challenges. Uh, Brian started talking about this in the, uh, in the opener. But it's not that easy to take a networking open source project and dump it into your enterprise um, without some cuts and bruises and learning experiences that go along with that. Um, and certainly at, uh, so at Solo, what, what we see uh, certainly as, a, as an opportunity is, is, is to help, how can we help, you know, alleviate some of the pain that goes along with that around installation, sure, but upgrades, those are hard. <laughs> um, things like not just new versions, but patching for security reasons. Um, deploying a service mesh for high availability and failover across multiple clusters. A lot of these enterprises, maybe they started off with something like OpenShift, and now when they went to a public cloud, they're gonna use EKS. And so they don't have one Kubernetes distribution, they have a couple different ones. Um, things like, how do they get their teams onboarded onto the platform that they're building around these container environments? What, how, how do they configure the behavior of the service mesh? Do they just use the Istio APIs directly? Those, were, those are pretty low-level APIs. Um, Istio's APIs weren't necessarily built for end-user consumption like that, like that, straight, straight like, like that. Um, and then having to solve things like compliance, um, having FIPS or FedRAMP certified and validated builds of, uh, of Istio or anything that touches your, your cryptography. 
um, you know, longer term support, tying in with other parts of your enterprise, like the API gateway. What does that start to look like now? As traffic's coming into a system. Maybe you already have an a API gateway. Now, and now you have two different APIs for describing uh, network and uh, uh, API policies, whether it's a service mesh and your, and your API gateway and so on. So how do you bring these things together? How do you tie it in with PKI? Because the service mesh is doing uh, things like assign, assigning identity workloads and issuing certificates and rotating certificates. So we need to be able to tie in and integrate with existing parts of the enterprise. So there's a lot of challenges around this. And, uh, and that's where you know, we, at, we at Solo have, have built our products to solve those problems. And you know, Brian mentioned uh, some of the successes that we've seen with our customers and um, you know, relying on the right technology, um, getting uh, a lot of education in, in people's hands and understanding where and how this stuff comes together is extremely important. And it